everyone. This is Levi Wampler with MMA Striking Coach Association. Today we're interviewing John Graydon. He's the Executive Director of Martial Arts Teachers Association, the best-selling author of books of how to run a successful martial arts school, including The Truth About Martial Arts. You can learn more about him at his website, www.martialartsschoolowners.com. How are you doing today, John? Very good, thank you. Good, good. Could you tell us a little bit about how you uh, got started in the martial arts? <laughs> That's an interesting story. Actually, I, it, it's a little bit odd. And, and bear with you for just a second. Here's the story. My father gave me a spanking when I was six years old <laughs> and sent me upstairs. But later in the evening, he invited me to come back down to watch TV with him. And I sat down, and I watched this show called The Green Hornet. And the Green mm-hmm. Hornet was a superhero, and his sidekick was Bruce Lee. And I had just had a, <laughs> you know, a traumatic experience of being spanked where you feel very powerless. Right. You feel out of control. And I was watching this TV show, and I noticed that the smallest guy on the screen was getting all the respect because he had this martial arts ability. Mm-hmm. And at that moment, I was determined to learn this stuff. And it wasn't until 1974 when I was 14 that I actually started into a martial arts school. I visited the school with my father. He would not pay for the lessons because I quit football the year before, and he thought I'd quit this as well. It was $25 a month for a year contract. But then, you know, he said, no, I'm not going to pay that. I got a call from the school owner a couple weeks later, and they, on the phone, asked me if I was interested in training. I said, yes, my dad won't pay for it. They invited me to come in and clean the school for my lessons. I was the original wax on, wax off kid, karate kid, back in 1974, and it really, truly changed my life forever and ever. So I'm eternally grateful to martial arts. That's great. It's a good story. Uh, now you've done a lot with consulting and teaching people how to run their martial arts schools. Could you tell us a little bit about maybe the best way to run your martial arts classes just to keep students interested? I think you've got to start with some very simple questions. Question number one. Why am I doing this? What is the point? Do I love the martial arts? Am I just trying to make money? Do I want to make good money doing what I love to do? And that really is the American dream. So in order to reach people and help them with the martial arts, you have to be good at marketing. You have to understand that the business you're in is sales and marketing. It's not a martial arts business. That's the end product. But the process of getting more people through that door, more people into your classroom, you can have a stronger impact in your community. So there's really a very altruistic vision and motivation to becoming very good at the business. If you love the arts and you think it's going to help people, then help as many people as possible by becoming a very good marketer for your school. And if we're talking specifically about MMA schools, the next step is to define, clearly define, who is your ideal student? How old are they? Is there a gender What kind of work do they do? What kind of background do they have? What's their income level? You really need to define both the demographics, in other words, where they live and their age, as I was just describing, and also the psychographics. The psychographics is a fairly recent development in the world of marketing, and it's essentially recognizing that people are attracted to certain types of feelings that they have, things that they value. Mm -hmm. For instance, the biggest psychographic group in America is called the Belongers. Now, the Belonger likes to belong. They like to belong to church. They like to belong to the union. They like to do things in groups. They don't like being singled out. In a sense, it's the blue-collar working man mentality, strong family value mentality, and that's a great market for a martial arts school. On the MMA side, however, the psychographics for that group is more closely aligned with what is known as the explorer group. And the explorer group's do not like convention. They like to break rules. They're very freedom-oriented, and they get bored very easily. And this is where we've seen extreme sports kind of come up over the last couple decades. And the Explorer group is a good match for MMA. The problem is they don't make much money, and that's where the MMA group is going to have some difficulties because if you – You've got to really decide, if I'm going to open this gym, is it going to be a gym? Is it going to be a school? What's the purpose of this? Am I trying to create competitors? Am I just teaching people the the skills of MMA? What's the end result that I'm trying to get here? Because that will greatly affect the appeal of your school. Mm -hmm. 
No, that's, that's really good information. Uh, no, this one's kind of for me, too. A few years back when I first started martial arts, I made a lot of mistakes. I was wondering what you think are the biggest mistakes most new instructors make when they're trying to uh, set up their yeah, this Yeah, that's a great question, about it, especially for MMA guys, because they're so passionate about what they're doing. They're doing. Here's what I, I, I coined this term over 20 years ago, and it's called black belt eyes. You, as a veteran martial artist or as an enthused martial, martial artist, have to understand that you represent about 1.5% of the population. We see things differently. We do things that most people wouldn't do. That's why we, we were able to endure and become black belts. So it's common for someone who's going to open a school to then create the school that they would like to attend. The problem is, again, only 1% to 1.5% of the population share those values. So you have to look at your school through market eyes. You have to look at the school through the eyes of the general public who really often don't think about martial arts. They don't desire to do martial arts. They think martial arts is just kind of weird because it is sometimes kind of dorky. <laughs> and MMA is much like NFL football. It may be fun to watch, but it doesn't mean I want to get out there and do it. Mm-hmm. So it, the, the common mistake of designing ads that, show how tough you are or how deadly you can become are typically big turnoff to schools, to prospective um, students. So again, it goes back to that question, what is my ideal student and what am I trying to accomplish here? For me, I wanted, one, always to be the most expensive school in town. That way I could position myself. Two, I wanted to be the martial arts celebrity in town. So within... A few years, I had my own TV show. I was in the newspapers constantly. When movies like The Karate Kid would come out, the newspaper would call me to go to watch the film with the reviewer. And he would basically profile me reviewing the martial arts film, like The Karate Kid. So I had a very clear vision for what I was trying to accomplish. And it took me a while, really, to kind of throw away my black belt eyes. I was raised in what we call it a dungeon dojo. And a lot of MMA schools are going to be very much like Dungeon Dojos, where you've got, you know, a bunch of guys that maybe have more tattoos than teeth that are uh, using foul language. And, again, you're going to, if you're trying to appeal to that group, you're appealing to a group that has very little disposable income. And that's, that's going to be a tough road to go down. So if you're going to do an MMA gym, my suggestion is to emphasize that it's safe, emphasize that it's uh, family-oriented, emphasize that it's a professional atmosphere with professional instructors, and mm-hmm. that your safety and comfort is our first concern. Because a lot of guys are coming out with ads with barbed wire in the, mm-hmm. as the border of the ad and blood dripping off the letters and, and, and talking about um, you know, house of pain, Mm-hmm. <laughs> discipline. These are some of the titles of schools that I've actually seen. They sound mm-hmm. like bondage centers. I mean, it's, <laughs> and that's a classic example of black belt eyes. So step one, define who you're really going to target, and two, look at your school through the market eyes. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really good. I wish I had known that a few years ago. I kind of did like you're talking about, and I marketed it as though it was what I wanted to do, and I wanted the hard school and the dungeon and all that, but. Yeah. People coming in really did. Yeah, you're going to the guys in town. <laughs> really, you know, and it, it, one of the things that I tell the guys, and, and this is, I mean, it doesn't go over all the time seminars, but when your wife or your girlfriend make, makes a comment or observation from a non-martial artist viewpoint about what you're doing, often it's met with disdain and resentment. How dare you tell me I'm a fifth degree black belt? What do you know about martial arts? <laughs> And in fact, 99.9% of the time, what they're saying or suggesting is spot on. It's exactly what you have to listen to and pay attention to because she doesn't care about the martial arts. She just cares about you. Mm-hmm. And when she says, you know, it's probably not a good idea to tie two kids together and have them fight each other <laughs> on the first night. You know? <laughs> so I went through all this stuff. I can, I can recall having heated battles with a girlfriend one time over different things in the school. In a retrospect, everything she said was right. Yeah. But I, I had black thought on it. Right, right. <laughs> That's good advice. Uh, now, could you share with us some of your favorite training materials or resources, any books, DVDs, workout equipment that you think everybody needs to know about? Well, I think martialartschoolers.com is a fantastic resource. Mm-hmm. It is 
literally 20 years of information on how to market and manage your martial arts school. And it doesn't matter whether it's an MMA school or a Taekwondo school. Marketing is marketing and business is business. Mm-hmm. So martialartschoolowners.com is a $24.95 a month subscription. You can cancel any time. But having a resource like that can just shave years and years of stress, wasted money, and wasted time. Joining the martialartschoolowners.com is an inexpensive resource, and then if you want to get more serious to hire me as a coach, that can be done. So, John, what is the best advice your mentors have ever given you about anything, life, business, martial arts, just any advice you feel that all of my subscribers should know about? That is a great question. It essentially is that an attitude of positive experience it's not even a real word, but positive expectations mm-hmm. is the best way to approach both life and business. And it's a developing a belief in yourself. And what we have, my, my, the latest book that I wrote was called The Imposter Syndrome. And this is a mainstream self-help book that applies really in many ways to martial arts because many of us got into the martial arts because we were insecure about our ability to take care of ourselves we went through a period of time where we were intimidated or powerless, like I described earlier. Mm-hmm. And the imposter syndrome is the feeling that you're not as smart or as talented as everyone thinks you are, that you're going to be found out as an imposter <laughs> at some point. And the first time I heard about this was I saw Paul Newman in a TV interview. He said that I always feel like one day someone's going to come to the crowd, grab me by the arm and say, it's over noon and it's all been a mistake. You're coming back to paint houses. And as soon as I heard that, I thought, holy cow, I know that feeling exactly. Mm -hmm. Because when I was a young martial artist, I was teaching maybe 10 hours a week. I always had cash to my pocket. I could sleep in late, chase girls all night. I mean, it was really a very easy life. Yet my friends were working 40, 50 hours at jobs they hated. Mm -hmm. And they never had any money. They never had any free time. And eventually I started to think, why me? Why, Why is this happening? How can I live this life? And and have this fun, get up and go for a run on the beach in the morning, and they go into work. And I, I actually contacted an ex-girlfriend of mine who was just really super intelligent. Mm-hmm. And she says, John, I know you. You wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> and that was just an emotional breakthrough for me that said, essentially, you can forge your own life. You can make this happen. You've got the goods. Go for it. And it was a, a, a turning point in my life. So that that really essentially is the answer to your question. It's, it's, it's giving yourself permission to succeed because in America anybody can do it. It just takes hard work. Focus mm-hmm. hard work. No, that's, that's a really good point because I have I've had that feeling too, you know, where you just feel like somebody's gonna find you out any minute. It's not <laughs> interesting when I I wrote the book, I've done a gazillion interviews, even though with Doctor Oz from the Oprah show, I did his show and on the air I said, I mean I'm sure the first time you took a scalpel to a human being <laughs> you thought and he finished the sentence for me. He goes how can they trust me to do this? <laughs> wow. Even Dr. Oz has the uh, imposter syndrome to some degree. So the response typically is what I just received from you. It's that kind of like, ah, oh, it's not just me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> For martial artists, we, you know, we're a very unique bunch, and I think I have a, a pretty good handle on, on what motivates martial arts, and, and that's why I wrote the book, The Imposter Syndrome. So... That's essentially it. That whole idea of getting permission to succeed is really crucial because there's a lot of countries, you know, where kids here in America, adults will say, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? There are a lot of countries where that question's not asked because there's no choice. You're going to grow up to be a farm worker. You're going to grow up in your caste. You'll never get outside of your level of society. So, and we take that for granted here in the States, but that's not the case. That's why you're seeing so many, so many revolutions in the Middle East right now. They want what we have, and too many of us just simply take it for granted and don't take advantage of it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you just, you, like you say, you grow up just always knowing, always hearing that question and never really think about other people not ever being asked. Yeah, yeah, I love, I love the Ronald Reagan statement. You know, he instilled so much pride in America that a, a, a lot of subsequent presidents have kind of stripped away, but he, he said in a speech, I'll never forget, it, it just open all the gates in all the countries in the world and watch the direction people go. <laughs> and you know, they're heading this way. Why are they coming here? Because we're the greatest 
country in the history of the planet. And, mm-hmm. and he, he really instilled that. And, you know, I said earlier that the American dream, and this is perfect for a martial artist, when you can do work that's congruent with your values, when you can do work where your work is your play, where you get up and you don't go to work, you go to teach, you go into the martial arts school. That is the American dream, to make a good living and do what you love to do. And with most martial artists, they, they discount the business side as being selling out, when in fact, the better you are at the business of martial arts, the more people you're going to reach and teach the martial arts too. Mm-hmm. So do you want to help 50 people, or would you rather help 500 people with the martial arts? Most schools end up at the 50 level because they don't execute on the business side. And then they, they say, well, we're not commercial. No, it has nothing to do with being commercial. You're just failing a lot of people you could be helping. It's very simple. Mm-hmm. And they'll say, well, I've got people that drive 45 minutes to my school. That's nice. Everybody does. It's mm-hmm. people that are five miles away that aren't coming to your school. Yeah. That's what we have to get. All right, well, you've made some really good points today. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. My uh, pleasure. This has been Levi Wampler with MMA Striking Coach. We've been speaking with John Graydon of, help me with the website again. MartialArtsSchoolOwners.com. SchoolOwners.com, that's it. All right, thank you. And uh, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you, guys.